Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Public Health Committee meeting. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order, uh, as we do have quorum. A reminder that all electric, electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function uh, during committee meetings. I'm just doing that myself, as a matter of fact. Um, and we're going to get started. So we'll start with uh, the first item, which is the approval of the agenda. Agenda, uh, Mr. Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? No, Madam Mayor, there are no changes to today's agenda. Okay, thanks very much. May I then have a mover and seconder, please, to approve the agenda as presented. Moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor McMeekin. Um, any discussion? No? Then we'll go to the vote, thanks. Councillor McMeekin's got a thumbs up. Oh, so does Councillor Huang. That carries 11 to zero, thanks very much. Are there any uh, declarations of interest? Seeing none. We will move on to the approval of minutes of the previous meeting, June 12th, 2023. May I please have a mover and seconder to approve the minutes of the June 12th, 2023 meeting. Moved by Councillor Maureen Wilson, seconded by Councillor Tadison. Uh, is there any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, we will go to the electronic vote. Please indicate your votes and the thumbs if necessary. Councillor McMeekin's got a thumbs up. Uh, carries 11-0, thanks very much. We're on to communications. May I please have a mover and seconder to put the communications items on the floor. Moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor uh, Alex Wilson. Count, uh, the um, vote is up. Oh no, sorry. Is there any discussion on the uh, communications items? Uh, Councillor Maureen Wilson, please. Thank you. There, um Thank you, Chair Horvath. Uh, there's two items I would like to speak to, please. 5.3 and, um, beg your pardon, 5.6. In, in, in 5.3, it's uh, a letter from the Medical Officer of Health uh, from my old hometown, uh, Sudbury District, uh, Dr. Sutcliffe. And it's a, a letter regarding Bill 103, which I'm, I'm happy to see that the recommendation is to be endorsed. I know... Uh, I don't believe Councillor Beatty is here, but I, I know he has spoken out strongly about the subject of, of vaping, and I found it really interesting that I believe his youth council, um, which I much admire, um, identified that amongst um, the, those young leaders, that it was issue number one. If I could just have a summary of uh, Bill 103, where we are, what it's recommending, and uh, what this... Um, what this public health unit has said or done about the matter. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, I'll put it over to staff. Dr. Richardson, please. Through you, Madam Mayor. So unfortunately today we don't have Kevin with us, McDonald, who of course has a long history around tobacco and vaping. Um, he's off sick today. I don't know if, if Brendan or Matt have any background that they can share. Otherwise, I would have to give you more extensive um, in follow-up by email, That's Councillor. Is that, is that satisfactory? Thank Very you. satisfactory. Um, I may lift from the email, perhaps at the next time we reconvene as a, as a public health uh, body. Thank you. If I could also then, in a similar vein, speak to 5.6. Um, it is from the, the president of, of Alpha, and I'm, I'm very proud and pleased to be on the executive of Alpha. It's talking about um, if you ever want to use it with your constituents, there's a lovely little graphic there, and I, I know we will be using it in our government um, relations about the importance of public health. And, um, you know, Chair, uh, public health is, um, it's, it's, it's the life jacket. It's, it's the bike helmet. It's, it's all about the prevention so that bad things um, don't happen. Um, but 
it's a tough case to make about the importance of investing in public health because success is usually invisible, right? Um, we don't we don't write the story about how well the the measles vaccine worked because there's no overwhelmingly there's no measles, so it, it doesn't make that that front page. Um, and as we know, um, in April 2019, Premier Ford uh, dropped a pretty big bombshell of a budget, uh, which was going to significantly cut uh, from public health units across this province. And I'd like us just to go into that space of the consequences of going into the pandemic, limping, um, less able, less nimble, less staffed in order to address um, something that hit worldwide and killed millions of people. That's why public health matters. That's why I know this body takes it very seriously. And I know uh, we will work together to champion its importance in our community um, and in our relationships with other levels of government. Um, because um, even if you are a conservative, if you do not believe um, in the moral importance, certainly, and I'm not saying conservatives don't, <laughs> but I am saying that there is economic return to be had with investing in public health because prevention saves lives, it saves money. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wilson. And uh, I, would, I would just say the other piece that was happening at the same time was the restructuring, uh, potential restructuring of public health, and so that was creating a lot of uh, disarray as well. Um, so, uh, and I, I would also just reiterate that, in fact, um, Public health is, doesn't fall on party lines generally or on ideological, in ideological spaces. We look to people like Hugh Siegel, in fact, who was uh, recently, uh, we lost. But, um, but I appreciate your comments. And uh, if there are no other speakers, which I don't see any, uh, thank you for raising those pieces. Are there any other? Oh, Councillor Clark, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, and I, I do want to thank Council Wilson, Maureen Wilson, for for raising that, reminding us. I recall sitting in <laughs> the good councillor's chair when that came to this body, and we talked about the implications, possible implications, of the restructured public health and the loss of the local intelligence that we have on the ground when we're dealing with. Um, an outbreak. We didn't use the term pandemic back there, but we most certainly cautioned that this will have an impact on that and the need for uh, local public health has been never more important as it is today. So I do want to thank the Council for, for raising that because I remember that day very well. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Clark. Uh, I don't see any further speakers. Is there any uh, other um, desire to pull things from communications seeing none then we had a mover and a seconder uh, we'll uh, go to the vote now then please thank you oh uh, councillor mcmeekin's got the thumbs up That carries 13 to 0. Thank you very much. We're now on to staff presentations. So I would invite uh, Dr. Richardson and Terry Ramirez to uh, please um, come to the podium and walk us through the Indigenous health strategy that has been uh, prepared by, by public health. When you're ready, take it away. There we go. <laughs> we all see the light. It's public health. There we go. All right. Thank you very much, Mayor, for the introduction. And uh, Terry Ramirez is here with me today, our Indigenous uh, Health Strategy Specialist, which uh, who I will introduce more so in a few moments and, and talk about some background first. And as well, we have Jessica and her team who are here, of course, to lead the Indigenous uh, issues across the corporation. And so very glad that they're here today. And this work is very much done together and, uh, and uh, in, in concert. And uh, we're glad to, to be here to present the health angle around um, our Indigenous strategies. 
So I just wanted to give a little bit of background before I turn this over to, to Terry. And so just to remind uh, the Public Health Committee that the Ontario Public Health Standards do um, have within their, the standards, the relationships with Indigenous Communities Guideline. And the intent of the guideline is to help boards to implement the requirements that are established in the health equity standard within the, uh, the standards overall. Within that, they're to engage with multi-sectoral collaboration around relevant stakeholders to decrease health inequities related to our Indigenous uh, communities and members. The guidelines do give us the fundamentals to begin to form that relationship in terms of what the expectations are, what it means to have a meaningful relationship with our Indigenous community. And it does, of course, come from a place of mutual respect, trust, understanding, and reciprocity. So public health services here in Hamilton are committed to an effective engagement with our Indigenous community. To provide direction for us to meet those standards, um, the Indigenous Health Strategy Specialist position was created in 2018, and Terry came on to fill that role. So overall, Terry's role is to engage and build relationships with our local Indigenous leaders, with our health system more broadly, and with community partners. Um, Terry works to plan and coordinate as well as lead strategic projects that are related to our Indigenous health in alignment with our overall urban Indigenous strategy and um, in keeping with the standards in order to improve health outcomes and increase uh, health equity for our Indigenous community. Uh, Councillor Wilson at Agenda Review asked me, um, you know, very focused as always on measures and whether or not we can tell that we're actually making a difference, it asked us, you know, do we have measures yet? in our, um, our key performance indicators to say that we're making that difference. And you'll see in our performance report today, those are not yet there. But you know, for the reasons that we're talking about today around the Indigenous health strategy, we want to not just say we're making a difference, we want to show we're making a difference in our relationships and in the outcomes that are being achieved. So that is work that is on our plan around uh, health equity and anti-racism as we move forward. So Terry began to engage the Indigenous community to develop an Indigenous health strategy in 2019. However, she became very much involved in helping us um, focus on the COVID-19 uh, response, in particular in relation to our Indigenous communities and Indigenous individuals here. And you'll know that they too suffered more during the COVID pandemic. And so the work that Terry did to help us address those health inequities was very key as we went uh, through the pandemic. She's now returned to doing her uh, usual work and uh, working on the strategy in 2022 and is here to present that today. Um, as we recognize the importance of self-determination, we looked to the Indigenous community for their direction, of course, with this strategy. You can see here a long list of individuals and organizations who were contacted for interviews to uh, give input into it. And um, at the request of those leaders, a survey was also distributed to the community to verify what the leaders were, were stating in their, uh, their interviews. So overall, we have, uh, you know, Terry's going to go on to talk about the strategy itself and the themes. Um, and uh, Terry's going to, to take a very interesting approach, which I think is very um, Indigenous. And I think you're going, I think it's a really beautiful piece you're about to experience. And I hope, uh, hope you will see that with me as you go through it today. Terry, over to you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, thank you. <laughs> to start with, I'm going to um, share a little bit about my background, but it's more importantly, it's a kind of introducing myself in more of an Indigenous way, because normally I just don't go, hi, I'm Terry Ramirez, I'm the Indigenous Health Strategy Specialist. That's not normally how we introduce ourselves. Go closer to the microphone or bring it closer to you, because it's, it's really difficult to hear. Okay, thank is you. that better? That's much better. Okay, so um, just so you know, the Canadian government recognizes me as Tuscarora, but um, through like following family traditions, I am Onondaga Eel Clan. Okay, so you know that. Um, in a Cree spiritual ceremony, um, I was given the name Gatamu Ted Musqua Esquale, meaning walking bear woman. And please excuse me for any mispronunciations because I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, my mother is Ruth the daughter of Eva and Robert Mount Pleasant, 
My grandfather, Robert, was a Haudenosaunee chief that was sitting in 1924 that was disbanded by the Royal um, Canadian Mounted Police. My dad, Victor Ramirez, is Jamaican, and his mother is Indigenous Jamaica and was a respected um, traditional healer and was well known across the island. And I currently reside on Six Nations. And I will now present the strategy. The recommendations have been categorized into these eight themes. And in the next slides, I will review each of these individually. So this presentation will provide you with a high-level overview of the report. I would direct you to the report for details. The photo is from the 2002 Mino Mambazawin Wagya Dasutse Social and is of DJ Shub, a well-known Juno award-winning artist, and his daughter Lily, who's dancing. This event was funded by the Hamilton Community Foundation. So traditionally, storytelling is used to convey teachings. I will be presenting each of these recommendations using this approach. Um, to begin, one of the questions we asked was why, what is a healthy community? And one theme that came out is a sense of community and it is not, um, it's a community focus rather than an I, me perspective. Relationship building. The Haudenosaunee Turo Wampum is the original agreement outlining the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Um, I should always say, whenever I talk about the belts, they ask me to say I'm not um, authorized to speak about the belts, so I'm not going to really go into detail, just kind of my understanding. So it is an agreement based on peace, friendship, and mutual respect. One of the key components of this agreement from 1613 is settlers and the Haudenosaunee each have their own governance and do not impose on each other. There's a lot more to this agreement, but I will not go into this. And we need to rebuild our relationships. Re or building relationships with the Hamilton Urban Indigenous Community, Six Nations of the Grand River, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation is vital to the success of anything developed by the city of Hamilton. To support self-determination, the Indigenous community will direct what is needed. And the Hamilton Public Health Services will collaborate and support the delivery of the mandated services. To help advocate and be an ally to decrease health inequities Indigenous people face. The strategy was developed with direction of the Indigenous community. Collaboration with Hamilton Public Health Services and the Indigenous community is already well underway. The United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and, Truth Rec and the Truth and Reconciliation Committee both recommend learning the truth is the first step to reconciliation. Hamilton Public Health Services has started providing staff with ongoing Indigenous cultural safety education in, and that started in 2019. And this was one of the recommendations from the community as well, to start with the truth. Building relationships with community by learning the truth and attending cultural events, increasing communication and sharing information and opportunities is vital to building relationships. Communication. Two-way communication, including listening, is an important part of any relationship. Just as in this photo, the two trees are connecting and their growth is dependent on each other. No one should be left behind. Recognizing that not everyone is connected to the internet or other media, information needs to be available in alternate forms. For example, paper format of newsletters, information boosts about services provided by the city, and people who are knowledgeable that can answer questions about those services. Another example is outreach via text, and also look at locations and hours of service may be a barrier. So offering services at various locations and times would address this barrier. These are examples of actions which can work towards building relationships with the community. Staffing and governance. In this photo, I am using the Cornhusk dolls as an analogy to represent the non-Indigenous peoples. Cornhusk dolls, have no face, and this is important to the story. The face of the doll was taken away because they focused on looking at the images, their own images in the water, rather than looking to the needs of the community. And just as the focus of the Cornhouse doll needs to return to the community, there is a need to have space for strong Indigenous voices in the community. 
and we need to listen to these voices. And um, the diversity of voices within Hamilton Public Health Services needs to be increased. So increasing the number of Indigenous employees at the city, of ha city brings Indigenous voices to the forefront and shifts focus back to the community. Development of Indigenous Health Governance Circle to guide Indigenous health initiatives, programs and services in Hamilton is essential for self-determination. Collaboration co-development. I have included another image of last year's social. Mino Bamazawin is Anishinaabe, which means a strong mind, body, and spirit. Waigat Dasutse, I know I didn't say that right, is Mohawk, which means I have a strong body. This was chosen as the name for the social, which was developed in response to the isolation caused by COVID-19 and the need for the community to come together for healing. This is a good example of collaboration and working together. Public Health Services and the city's Indigenous Relations team partnered with Hamilton Indigenous organizations to bring the social to the community. Community being together, the music, the dancing, the traditional food are all important to healing. Everyone on stage, backstage, sound, catering, they were all Indigenous. And this provides an opportunity for the youth to see successful, thriving members of their community showcased. And helps con it also helps combat inaccurate portrayals of Indigenous people. Peoples. The social celebrates artists and brings the Indigenous community together to celebrate its culture and invites non-Indigenous people to join in the celebration. The importance of communication was mentioned in an earlier slide, and this social allows the city and other organizations to communicate about their services via information booths. Of note, the COVID-19 vaccine was available at both the 2021 and 2022 socials. This vaccine, or the provided vaccine in accessible and safe setting. So we hope to offer COVID-19 flu and flu vaccines at this year's social, taking place on September 23rd at Gage Park. And I hope everybody is able to attend and um, celebrate with us. There are many other opportunities to support self-determination, collaboration, and co-development. For example, public health services and its programs and services such as prenatal, postnatal, breastfeeding and parenting programs, health promotion, and senior dental services. Equitable and safe services. I'm going to tell you the story of the three sisters as it relates to the needs for equitable and safe services. The corn is planted in the center and offers support to the beans. The beans add nitrogen to the soil, which helps all the plants grow. The squash cools the soil, and with their leaves, they hinder weeds, and their prickly nature deters small animals. They work together to support each other, creating a safe environment, and allowing each other to grow and be the best they can be. I like this story because it mirrors the power of supporting one another and all the, and what can happen with collaboration and co-development. The Indigenous community is asking for a sense of belonging, safety, and inclusivity. All services are culturally safe and improving and providing a welcoming physical space, increasing access to services that include and respect traditional knowledge access to affordable safe housing, safe mental health services with counseling and continuity of care. Mental health services need to be available at a time when they are needed without a waiting list. Build and expand on the successes, for example, Indigenous system navigation. Ensure everyone is aware of all the services and programs available. That is what the community said they need for equitable and safe services. Resources, and I'm mentioning one of the belts again, so as I said, I'm not authorized to speak about the belts. So a dish with one spoon. Sharing and caring for land and resources. Resources available to everyone. Everyone eats. No one takes more than they need. Never take the first one. Always leave some for others, including the plant, the animal, the birds, and leaving some for our mother, the earth. This is similar to what the community is asking with respect to sharing resources. One example could also be inviting staff of Indigenous organizations to attend professional development opportunities at the Hamilton Public Health Services. 
advocacy. The Indigenous community needs your help as, a, as an ally to advocate. Indigenous communities are still in need of one of the most basic rights, clean water. Even Six Nations that is so close to Hamilton is in need of easy access to clean water. Advocate for clean, safe water. Advocate for funding for Indigenous services, including health and housing services. Advocate for equitable wages. There is a big divide of income for staff of Indigenous organizations compared to non-Indigenous organizations. Staff, for example, mental health workers. It's hard to recruit and, reten and, and retention issues because mental health workers are paid so little in comparison to mainstream. And this not only impacts the retention of the staff, but this also impacts the trust and relationship building with their clients. Because if you can't keep the same person there all the time, they have to tell their story again, they're less likely to come back. So this is really, really important. An Indigenous person finds it harder to get a job, find housing, have an adequate income, and this is basically just because of racism. So we need you to advocate. There's often only one Indigenous person at a decision or planning table. Add your voice to their voice. Advocate. In public service, we are at a unique position to advocate and support and be allies. Advocate to make system changes to reduce dispro dispro I can't even talk. disproportionately high levels of poverty, incarceration, violence, and missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. Access to Indigenous traditional knowledge and practices. Traditional varieties of corn have been preserved by the seed keepers. Traditional corn still grows and is harvested today, and it is prepared by lying the corn with hardwood ashes. This method of preparation is thousands of years old, which makes corn easier to digest and more, nutri more nutritious and a higher source of protein. It's important that Indigenous traditional knowledge is preserved and the knowledge is passed on for future generations. This knowledge needs to be honoured and valued by all and not questioned. Indigenous peoples have survived for thousands and thousands of years using traditional knowledge. Indigenous community knows what's needed to heal. For example, this includes traditional foods their, and their preparation, medicines, ceremonies, birthing practices, breastfeeding, and breastfeeding supports. It's not limited to just that, but it is essential to understand the importance of family and community in the connection of healing. Therefore, it's important to have events to gather, such as the social I spoke about earlier. Given this, and the connection and proximity to Six Nations of the Grand River, and Mississauga is the credit First Nation, it would be beneficial to have transportation to and from the city to allow attendance at cultural events and ceremonies and to visit family. With all, that, all of what I have shared with you today, there is little that is new. We've heard much from the Indigenous community before, and it's important to note that there is an alignment with what is contained with the Hamilton Urban Indigenous Strategy. Hamilton Public Health Services has and will always continue to work closely with the City Indigenous Relations team. Specifically, there is an alignment with a number of actions found in the Hamilton Urban Indigenous Strategy. Rather than talking about each of these now, I will direct your attention to the Hamilton Public Health Services Strategy document to see the alignment, the Indigenous Strategy. In closing, there's other opportunities where public health services can work with others alongside the Indigenous community. For example, with respect to data collection, the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, Greater Hamilton Health Network, Ontario Health West, and Ontario Health West. So working together, we will make Hamilton stronger and for the community. Niall Goa for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Terry, I appreciate it, Danielle, and I would ask if there are, Elizabeth, it's now time for some questions, right? Can, can members of uh, committee uh, please identify if you have some questions uh, for Terry? Uh, Councillor Kretsch, please go ahead. Hi, Terry. Sorry, I'm up behind you on the screen. Um, and thanks for this presentation very much. I'm really encouraged also to see that you foregrounded the work that was done in collaborating with other groups in the city. I think we don't 
hold those uh, groups, uh, you know, I guess I would say in our mouths. We don't we don't say the names of them. We don't see them written down. We don't think about the work that's being done behind the scenes. And I think it's really important to foreground the fact that that you were able to do this work. Um, I really think it's amazing that we have Indigenous leadership inside the city doing this work and leading on this strategy. I think that's very important. And you talked a little bit about working with the Indigenous relations folks at the city um, and, you know, seeing seeing your ability to be here in this department and doing that leadership work. Could you speak a bit about how um, that's impacted the work? Because I think it's perhaps a little bit unique in terms of the way the whole city is structured, um, that we have this leadership embedded in public health and your ability to really do this work. Um, how has that been aided by you being able to be there and working with everybody? Thanks, Councillor Crutch. Go ahead, Terry. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand. So you want to understand how I'm working with the Urban Indigenous Strategy and the other organizations? Yeah, sorry, I could have been clear. <laughs> um, I it's, think that I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to what advantages you think um, oh, okay. you know, in this work by being able to be embedded in public health in the department itself, right? Yeah, there is a lot of advantage for being right embedded in public health as, as I see it because public health is about health and a lot of like public health is about prevention. And with Indigenous traditional culture, a lot of that stuff is about prevention, traditionally for healing as well. So to me, public health is key in um, helping health move forward because it's that same values about prevent things before they happen and supporting things holistically and not just individually. Thank you. Councillor Crutch? Thanks, I appreciate that. I had a couple more questions and they are mostly about uh, the TRC, um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I noticed there was a chart in this strategy, which I really appreciated it very much. As somebody who uh, understands charts well and can use them well, I appreciated seeing how we're, how we're mapping out the different uh, UNDRIP, TRC, different things that are going on to ensure that we're, we're tackling these challenges. Um, there are three other TRC calls under sports and recreation. I think it's, if I have it in front of me somewhere, 87, 88, and 91, talking about calling on all levels of government, you know, to ensure that we honor uh, traditional uh, sports um, in Aboriginal and Indigenous communities, as it's written here. So I wondered if you could speak to where you see that playing out in terms of, in terms of the organization. I guess my mind went to like, hey, health and recreation and sport are, are somehow linked together, right? And I thought, well, maybe that's actually not for this department. So I wondered if you could talk about that a bit. Thank you, um, please. Through you, Mayor, maybe I'd ask um, Jessica. Welcome, Jessica. Good morning. Director Chase, sorry. Uh, I'm Jessica Chase. I'm the Director of Children's and Community Services, um, and the um, Indigenous Relations team is part of our division, uh, which has responsibility for the Urban Indigenous Strategy. Um, and there are actually um, a couple of different recommendations contained within the Urban Indigenous Strategy that speak to um, sport and recreation. I think it's certainly an area that we have further opportunities to explore um, and something that we would want to explore in partnership with the Indigenous community. So I'll just uh, list a couple of these here so you're aware of them. A um, couple of the recommendations contained in the strategy include creating opportunity for young Indigenous athletes to develop their skills as well as increasing opportunities for Indigenous and non-Indigenous residents to play Indigenous sports and recreation activities. Um, so we have included those within the strategy, um, but certainly I think there's further work for us to do in partnership with the community in moving those forward. Thank you, Director Chase. Councillor Critch. Thanks so much. My last, uh, last question, and I hope uh, that uh, this makes sense. Uh, in the TRC, recommendation number 22 is under health and it's quite broad and it speaks to, you know, it says we call upon those who can affect change within the Canadian healthcare system to recognize the value of Aboriginal healing practices, use them in the treatment of Aboriginal patients in collaboration with Aboriginal healers and elders where requested by Aboriginal patients. So really the focus on being we're calling upon people in the, in the, who can affect change within the healthcare system to recognize the value. You spoke to us earlier about, you know, what we can do. Um, when it comes to us advocating for change, what do you think council can do to ensure that we're centering, more centering, um, you know, um, healing practices? 
Go ahead. Through, you, through you, Mayor, um, one of the things that I think is really important is those Indigenous voices. You need those Indigenous voices to know and help you advocate and know what you're advocating for. Um, I agree 100%. There needs to be more um, traditional healers, traditional elders with that knowledge. And I think, this is me, and I think that that knowledge will not just help the Indigenous community, but it'll also help the broader community. I'm a firm believer of that if we go back to some of the traditional ways, as I talked about the importance of corn, that's really significant. Possibly who knows what's gonna happen, right? With the um, higher level of protein, if it's prepared a different way. There's a lot of things where we could possibly work together and help. I hope that answers your question. It thank does, you. thank you so much. And thank you for your presentation today. Thank you, Councillor Kretcher. Are there any other questions? Uh, for the presenter, uh, Councillor Alex Wilson, please. Thank you, and through you, Mayor, thank you so much for the presentation. Really appreciate the use of storytelling combined with the report as well to present information more holistically as well and like think about things in different different ways. I really appreciated that because um, that's novel to me sitting around this table, so thank you. Um, am I fully supportive of what's in front and more so questions about now what comes next? Um, and so seeing that the next step is an Indigenous health governance circle, creating action-oriented plan, having that plan be co-developed and completed by the end of 2024, um, I would expect that means that costing, financing, say there's an action we want to take on, um, some of those things may get referred to budget 2025. Um, that's okay. It's, I think it's important to do that consultation work, make that plan for sure. If there are steps or early opportunities, how can we as councillors or we around this horseshoe support this work before the 2025 budget, knowing that we're doing some plan building? So for example, if we're looking at a new community garden in our ward or some things like that, are there some intersections where you see the ability to support as we develop this action-oriented plan? Thank you. Through you, Mayor, I'm gonna give this to Jen if she could answer this for us. Thanks, thank Jen. you, Terry, and through you, Mayor, to the Councillor, thank you for the great question. I think what you're saying is, is as we're engaging with our Indigenous communities, should there be opportunities to implement things early? Can we bring it forward to Board of Health so that we can move to action uh, more quickly rather than waiting to the 2025 budget process? Uh, and we do have a commitment to work with our Indigenous community to have an implementation and action plan, but we will also work with them to think about what are the quick wins and what are some of the things that we could implement early uh, and bring that back to uh, the Public Health Committee at relevant times to talk about how we can move things forward. I hope that answers your question. Happy to add more details if it doesn't. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, it does answer the question, and I guess I'll just offer and be available, as and I think others would as well. I think there's a oh a cross. I'm very interested in further follow up, but I guess I think there's a cross between some of the other hats we wear. So, for example, many of us sit on the Agricultural and Rural Affairs Committee. If there's some conversations that could start earlier, if there's some ways that we can start these links early, I think there's a lot of willingness to do some of that. And so, happy to maybe connect offline, hear this answer about how to be helpful in that work. Thanks so much, Terry. You had something to add. Um, yeah, through you, Mayor, just, I just wanted to add one thing too, like, because I started doing this strategy and interviewing people before the pandemic. So one of the things I did do after the pandemic hit and I was switched to COVID-19, I took some of the things that they said from that and started working to help with the COVID-19. So one of the things was um, working with community, asking community what they needed. So we worked together to put up the indigenous COVID, COVID vaccine clinics, things like that. And that was from is kind of where we can already start, we're already starting, so that helps. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any further questions. Um, so then I will uh, say on behalf of the, uh, the committee, thank you so much all of you for being here uh, for the presentation and uh, answering our questions. We, we really appreciate it and it, it was very inspirational and very thoughtful uh, and very welcoming. And so I, I really look forward to the ongoing relationship as the, as the chair. So, and I know all the committee members are, are feeling the same way. So thank you all very, very much, uh, much appreciated. So we are then going to, and you can go relax now. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. Uh, we're now going to uh, vote on the um, re receipt of the presentation. Uh, so can we have a mover and seconder to receive, please? Uh, moved by uh, Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Alex Wilson. Um, the, oh, the electronic vote is up.
And uh, Councillor McMeekin's thumb is up. That carries 13 to zero. Thanks very much all. Uh, so now the uh, report is on the floor. Uh, may I have a mover and seconder to put the report actually on the floor. Moved by Councillor Tattison, seconded by Councillor Francis. Uh, is there any discussion on the report? Seeing none. Um, I think that indicates the impressive work that was just done by the presenters and uh, the f uh, fullness of the report. So thanks so much. Uh, we'll go to the electronic vote then. Oh, Councillor McMeekin's thumb is up as well. That carries 13 to zero. Thanks very much, everyone. We're now on to the uh, consent items. We don't. We have the Food Advisory Committee minutes. I may have a mover and seconder to put item 9.1 on the floor, please. Moved by Councillor Pauls, seconded by Councillor Jackson. Councillor Clark. Can I just get an understanding as, as to why it has taken so long for the minutes of this committee to come here? It looks like they're starting in 2020. Very unusual. Just wondering what, what happened. Uh, Dr. Richardson, please. Through you, Mayor. Um, yes, indeed, the councillor is correct. It's taken a, a good amount of time for the minutes to actually come back. This is the same answer you will hear from us repeatedly about anything that happened between 2020 and 20, the beginning of 2023, which is we were able to get the meetings done, we were able to get the minutes done, but the minutes did not get processed all the way through to come forward. Um, to uh, to the public health committee during the pandemic. So um, it's not the timeline we would at all like to follow in usual course of business. We usually try to have them out. They do have to go through the cycle of approval by the committee, of course, and that sort of thing. But uh, we will return to our usual practice of having them here in a much more timely manner. Councillor Clark. Thank you very much. It's just important that we have that put on the record. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none then, we will go to the vote. <clears throat> Councillor McMeekin has a thumbs up. That carries 13 to zero. Thank you very much. Uh, 9.2, Public Health Services 2022 Annual Performance and Accountability Report. Can I have a mover and seconder to put that on the floor, please? Moved by Councillor Alex Wilson, seconded by Councillor Clark. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything that uh, the staff want to say in advance, so we'll go to Councillor Alex Wilson uh, on the report, and then Councillor Jackson. Thank you. I really appreciate this report. I do just kind of want to focus in on some of the numbers in the appendix specific to sexual health testing, so that's kind of the focus of my questions today around sexual health services. Um, I'm just looking at the numbers, seeing, and it's not specific to Hamilton, we're seeing a rise in drug resistance, um, sexually transmitted diseases across North America, across the world. Um, understanding COVID, we had to reprioritize service delivery. Um, I know that our sexual health services have definitely gone down in terms of accessibility and availability of hours during the pandemic. Wondering what future operational plans are in future years, scaling back up, looking at geographic, like across the city, or sorry, I guess, where are we going next? And do some of these numbers here inform where we're going next? Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Through you, Mayor. So, um, the sexual health clinic example is a very good example of um, where we're finding we have pressures across many of our programs and services. Um, we have additional work that we need to do because COVID's not going away and we have three times the number of outbreaks um, in the, the last just in the last wave than we would normally have as other outbreaks came forward. We have more cases to follow up. We have more infection control issues to address. Um, we're finding pressures across many, many of our programs and services. Um, and so what you're going to see happen over the coming months with us as we prepare for both the, the council's uh, city budget as well as preparing for the annual service plan and budget for 2024 
is you're going to see us as we work through grappling with those pressures and how do we address those, where are the choices that, that need to be made um, in order to pick the highest priority um, items to move forward with. And there's no doubt that there's way more work than uh, we could possibly do. There always is. I mean, that's just a truism. Um, but as the, the pressures are there, both on a, from a public health perspective, the, the worsening of issues that we've talked about across the spectrum, um, there's going to need to be some choices about what, what we do and, and what doesn't get done. And so that's what we're grappling with now. Certainly, we look at the numbers. And Susanna, who uh, heads up this program, has brought those to us, talked about those, and it's part of the process that we're working through. So you can expect as we come back with the annual service plan and budget and the priorities for 2024, that you're, uh, you're going to see some of those addressed. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. I appreciate that we'll kind of hear, hear what that direction is and hear where we may be able to scale up given competing pressures um, or given, given the kind of the whole situation in a future report. Um, looking back at 2022, and I may have just missed it in the report, I um, was doing some control effing to find the relevant sections, but wondering if there's any summary statistics that could be shared on monkeypox vaccine distribution. Um, just didn't see that in the, the section I was looking at some of the other things. And if we would consider that a successful rollout, if we have we're worried about how it's been going. Again, scaling it up, scaling it down, just how that's going. Dr. Richardson. Thank you, Mayor. I'll pass that over to either Jordan or Brendan, or perhaps both to speak to. Okay, over to you. Thank you, Jordan Walker, uh, Director of Communicable Disease Control. Uh, I'll start and then I'll pass it over to Brendan if there's anything, or Dr. Lou, sorry, if there's anything additional to uh, to provide. But um, so no, there are the numbers as it relates to um, the monkeypox vaccination are not in there. Certainly, if that's oh, sorry through the chair to the councillor, the numbers uh, on the monkeypox vaccination um, campaign are not contained within the annual service plan um, accountability agreement indicators. But we could certainly provide that to you if that is something that the councillor is interested in. I will say that in general. Um, it was a, a successful campaign here in Hamilton. We were able to vaccinate a number of individuals, and apologies, I don't have that number at my fingertips, but uh, we're able to reach those individuals and connect with them through, uh, through communities where we were able to access them and provide that vaccine. Um, and we're able to, I mean, certainly not just here in Hamilton, but, but uh, across the province, we're able to see uh, the, the significant impacts of that and that we didn't see an ongoing outbreak and did see a tapering off and a decline in those cases. So um, I, I would say overall, that was a successful endeavor. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Liu? Yeah, um, to the Chair to the Councillor, not too much to add, to add to that, but just to say that uh, I would say this has been a fairly successful rollout across the province as well, to, to the point where this, this outbreak has been declared over, over provincially. And, and um, I uh, anecdotally can say that we still do see a trickling in of, of doses being delivered. Um, directly by, by us uh, at our sexual health clinic, but uh, uh, certainly not at the volumes as had been occurring during, during this outbreak. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Just, I think one last, com uh, one last question and a very quick comment for me. Um, with respect to the PrEP or um, pre-exposure uh, prevention for HIV, um, seeing that there was a link between potentially higher levels of PrEP um, and an increased rate of syphilis because people maybe think they're protected from one thing, but then, of course, there's other pieces going on. So saw that as the rationale there and just wondering, at our clinics, um, are we providing PrEP prescriptions? Do we have stats on if that increase in community use of PrEP is maybe coming from referrals from our sexual health kind of clinics or if that's maybe coming from Freddie and other types of more telehealth kind of accessibility support. So getting a sense of to what role are we playing in that use or to what role is that happening? People are using telehealth and other providers to get access to that medication. Director Walker or Dr. Liu? Yeah, yes, through the chair to the councillor. Um, so our, our sexual health clinics do not provide PrEP services directly, but we do do facilitate connection to, to services, be that through referral to local providers or, or online services, as, as you've indicated. Um, there, there's a couple of potential drivers of, of some of the um, trends that you've, you've identified, and, and that may be related to, to practices. Uh, it also may be related to people uh, being tested frequently while, while they're undergoing um, 
uh, while they're being followed by, by a prep provider, um, for example. And so definitely something um, that, that we're aware of and, and does inform our, our health teaching and counseling to, to people um, who may be diagnosed with sexually transmitted infection or who may be, we may be seeing for, for testing or, or more, more routine care. Um, and, but, but the actual prep uh, prescription itself is, is not being provided uh, through our clinical service. Councillor Wilson. Thank you so much. Just, I think one of the reasons this is top of mind for me as we're hearing this report is a friend of mine was recently, you know, doing some regular getting updates at the sexual health clinic and individuals were coming in that didn't have an appointment and weren't able to access services and were looking for an emergency appointment. Obviously folks looking for that emergency appointment are generally anxious, fearful about something, potential exposure, um, understanding that you know, three hours a week at different locations, we're doing the best we can. So just want to share that story, share that experience, and also stay very open to as we move forward to that 2024 service plan, um, supporting an increase in this, because I think this is something where we're hearing that pressure and it does target different communities differently and something that I think we need to line a sight on as we move towards the 2024 budget. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Councillor Jackson, please. Thanks, uh, Mayor Horvath. And if uh, Dr. Richardson could just turn to page five for me, please. Financial performance. So Dr. Richardson, just a series of quick questions to uh, update me and refresh my memory. Basically, the province is on uh, a continued 70%, 30% cost sharing with the municipality on mandatory programs. Through you, Mayor Horvath, please. Dr. Richardson. Through you, Mayor. So the the um, ministry sets its cost sharing um, formula by policy, and it was set at seventy five twenty five prior to twenty eighteen with a number of hundred percent funded programs. The city does. When we look at public health services as a whole, it's important to realize there are services outside of that that we provide, like ADGS and CNAS, that are hundred percent provincially funded and that there are also some other levy programs that are completely levy funded. So we're speaking right now just about the ones that are um, part of the Ontario Public Health Standards. So yes, they, they decided to move their policy to 7030, that, uh, and then they gave mitigation funding, which persisted throughout the, the pandemic to bring us to, a, to what would have been in 2018, a 7525 ratio. Um, I will say their intent can, that, as far as we understand, is to continue to end the mitigation funding at the end of this year. We've not heard anything different from that. I will note that um, the increases in the time since 2018, there's only been one 1% 1 increase, I believe, in 2021. Um, from a provincial standpoint, so that ratio continues to diverge from 7525 uh, with the levy making up the shortfall. And so you see the, the chart that is also in the appendix, the financial ap appendix, that shows the changing proportion, um, I'm just scrolling down myself, um, that shows the changing proportion that is paid from the levy. I was calculating last night, Councillor, no, that's fine, uh, I don't Dr. have it exactly where it's at now, but we would be sitting at 70-30 or close there too, I would say, by now, even with, with the mitigation funding. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Uh, Mayor Horvath, uh, I, I looked through the charts there on Appendix A. Um, so the 75-25 went to 70-30, up some one time during the pandemic, um, my uh, layman's language. And, uh, and unfortunately, it sounds like it has not reverted back to the 7525 overall. That's unfortunate. The positive variance that you show here at the end of last year, Dr. Richardson, the 10,394,702, was that clawed back by the province or were you able to hopefully bank that in some reserve through you, Mayor Horvath? Dr. Richardson? Through you, Madam Mayor. So when it comes to the um, the surpluses, those were almost entirely in the COVID spending. And so those were the, the COVID response dollars and the COVID vaccination dollars. And so we had put forward our best guess as to <laughs> what the pandemic might do over the course of the year and what the vaccine supplies would do and the vaccine uptake would do. And um, of course, those changed as the year went on. We would start with, with a more worst case scenario from a pandemic perspective and a best case scenario from an uptake perspective. Um, and so they did claw back those funds because they were largely around COVID-19 and resources not needed for COVID-19. 
the resources that were for public health more broadly, um, that uh, we were not able to deliver on all the programs and services as it talks about what, in the piece about meeting all of the standards. Um, those uh, resources were reallocated by the province to COVID-19 uh, efforts first. Um, and so they were they were used up in that way. So there were, were no resources to bank and the provincial policy doesn't allow us to retain any funds um, in a reserve. That's unfortunate, but thank you for the reality of what you shared. Lastly, next paragraph, uh, Ontario Seniors Dental Health Care Program. That's 100% provincially funded, wonderful. Uh, one check mark for the province. I said one. Um, anyways, um, we received 3.6 million, spent 2.9, and once again, they're clawing back 686. Uh, Mayor Horvath, is that because the uptake of our program, uh, if it was greater, we could have used the additional dollars and maxed out, or is there some logistic? Can you give me some reason why, unfortunately, we couldn't keep the balance for hopefully future seniors across our city that need oral health and otherwise within their limited disposable income would never be able to afford it? That's my last question, Mayor Horvath. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Jackson. Hi, Jen vickers Manson, Director of Healthy Families and Chief Nursing Officer through the chair to you, Councillor Jackson. Thank you for the question. Um, there was underspending in the dental program due to the redeployment of staff for the first quarter of the year to COVID um, program work. And so our programs were not up and fully running and functional. So it was, it was not uh, the demand for service, which was um, really very high. And as we've discussed previously at this public health committee, we do have backlogs in our dental services program related to those programs being on hold. It was more that uh, staff were being paid through COVID funds as they were doing COVID work and we were not fully operational as a dental program until the end of 2022. And as Dr. Richardson has indicated, uh, the way the budget approvals work and the policy that drives budget uh, requires us to return those funds um, and then we'll see those same dollars flowing next year. Okay, so Director vickers Manson, just to conclude then, uh, the number of eligible applicants, no one will be suffering for the rest of this year or not receiving the municipal service because we returned 686, the amount you kept, even through COVID, but the amount you kept will service those that are eligible for seniors oral dental health care. Through you, Mayor Horvath, correct? Through the chair, uh, that is correct, Councillor, but I do want to be transparent in saying that there is a backlog and wait, and wait for services at this time. Okay, so again, Director, I'm not trying to be pedantic here. Look that one up on Google, colleagues. Uh, um, yep. I'm not trying to be pedantic, but I'm just saying no one will not receive the service because the additional monies were returned. In other words, if we can make the case, there's an outstanding list of eligible Mayor Horvath, mm -hmm. and we'd love to service those additional seniors with oral health and our mobile bus, but we can't because the province clawed back. Did we make the argument that we have an outstanding list, uh, Director, or am I missing something? Um, we did not make the argument. Um, a part of the issue is uh, our ability to recruit relevant staff um, and the, our ability to push through in the dental clinic spaces that we currently have. So I'll just remind uh, the Public Health Committee as well that we did get approval from um, the ministry around an increase in capital dollars to increase and build a new to operatory clinic for seniors that we are planning for and that build will be initiated uh, at the end of 2023 and open in 2024. I believe the one was on Upper James, hopefully on the mountain. Director vickers Manson, I'm satisfied for now, but I think the need is still great out there. We might need additional dollars. Thanks, Mayor Horvath. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Clark, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Horvath. Just two lines of, of, of thought. Our, uh, our staff worked heroically uh, through the pandemic. Many of them were redeployed into areas in the city that they had uh, little experience. Uh, they went to work uh, every day. Uh, they tried to keep the place afloat while being nervous about contracting the disease and bringing it home to their families. This was our experience 
of our staff. Can I get an understanding? Have we conducted an assessment or an understanding of what the psychological and social impacts were on our staff and their mental health? Thanks, Councillor Clark. Director Vickers. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Clark, thank you for the question. Um, so the, the short answer is yes. Uh, we did gather uh, data on how our staff were doing throughout the course of the pandemic, and we did that in a few ways and at separate points in time. Um, and one of the ways that we did that is we engaged with a researcher who was studying specifically the impact of staff being involved in COVID on their mental health and well-being. And we used uh, that survey with our staff, which had a high uh, return yield. And we, and we received the results of that survey that helped to develop our mental health and well-being plan for our staff. Um, and then in addition to that, you'll recall that we brought forward an after action review uh, report to the Public Health Committee and through the process of debriefing um, the COVID response, we were able to receive further feedback from staff around the impact of deployment and engaging in the types of work that they were doing. Um, and then in addition to that, at the same time, you'll know that corporately the City of Hamilton um, released the Our People survey. And so we've been able to use the results of the Our People survey in combination with the other inputs that I mentioned to really have a fulsome mental health and well-being plan for our staff that's translated into action plans that we can monitor as we move forward to see how our staff continue to do. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Clark. Uh, the uh, uh, supplemental question would be, will there be annual reports uh, to the Board of Health with regards to um, that ongoing assessment. Director Pickers. Through the chair to you, Councillor, thanks for the question again. At this point in time, we don't have plans to bring forward a report uh, related to our staff, mental health and well-being, and, and the status of where they're at. I know it's kind of crossing over two divisions, human resources as well as public health, so I will uh, raise it with the executive director of our human resources. And the last question that I have is with respect to the mental health of the residents of Hamilton. We heard numerous anecdotal stories of the stress that the pandemic was causing to families, individuals. We have heard about a significant increase in intimate partner violence and, and, and violence against children. Um, can you tell me how or what the province is doing to improve mental health services in our community? Because what I am hearing from residents is it is taking two years to get their son or daughter in to see a psychiatrist while they're suffering from serious mental health issues. It is taking a year or more to get in to see a psychologist, the challenges are compounding and, and I'm concerned about the overall well-being of the mental health of our residents. So how, how are we monitoring that and what is the province doing to help us ensure that that, that those services are available. Thanks, Councillor Clark. Dr. Richardson, please. Through you, Mayor, to the Councillor. So, you know, mental health is one of those issues. It's a responsibility of us all. And from a health perspective, is the responsibility, the responsibilities are parsed out into different parts of both the health and the social um, service system. And so, provincially, there is a strategy around mental health from a health perspective um, that is being moved forward. I don't have the details with me at this point in time. Um, I would say the GHHN has had the Greater Hamilton Health Network, our local Ontario health team has had mental health 
as a, uh, a priority now for some time and is working to move forward initiatives in that regard. They are largely directed by what comes through from, uh, from the province and through Ontario Health to act on specific pro um, issues. So, for example, um, you know, working on issues around uh, the care and treatment of those with schizophrenia, um, and uh, and moving forward in that regard, they have a number of others that are there. And so, as the GHHN reports to this committee each year, they can speak to the actions that are being taken around mental health from that perspective. The um, piece for us in public health services ha covers a number of spectrum, the number of parts of the spectrum. So the first is from the standpoint of understanding what the state of the health is of our population. And so to say like, where are we at? Um, there is a health check report. You'll have received, it, received an update in the last day or two around that. And the broader report on the health status, not the treatment, not the system status, around mental health, the, the health status will be coming forward in early 2024. We are working with health system partners um, over the, the coming months to make sense of that, that information and data and understand it. So we're hopeful we'll be able to bring you a richer understanding um, of both the health status, but also how it relates to needs in the community from a care standpoint as one uh, part of the issue. And then we do have two uh, mental, specific mental health programs that run ADGS and CNAS, um, alcohol, drug, and gambling services for adults and child and adolescent mental health services for children. Um, you're going to see a, uh, in response to some of the questions earlier, you're going to see it uh, at our well, September meeting, September meeting. Um, a broader piece around the state of children's mental health and the services that are provided. And so that's specific to the children's sector. Um, and, you know, we also have the harm reduction pieces and you've seen us uh, and the addictions pieces and you've seen us come back around harm reduction and where we think the community is at and what the needs are on that front. So it's a complex issue. Um, to speak to and, and we're trying to, to address components of it as we go through those different means. Um, but it, it is complex and to bring it all forward and understand it at once is, is very challenging. And so we're trying to get our heads around how can we help to do that um, through the various avenues that we have. Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you for that comprehensive uh, response. I've been in politics, I guess, uh, 17 years now between the province and at the municipality. I have never heard so many anecdotal stories from residents in my community about the mental health of their uh, young people and the increase in suicides. So I look forward to that report coming forward from the Greater Hel Hamilton Health Network uh, to help us understand whether or not there is appropriate level of services for our young people. Because as I said, um, Chair Horvath, I keep getting responses from residents that they are waiting up to two years to get a teenage son or daughter to see a psychiatrist. And some of them are not making it. And that's on us we have to speak up, we have to make sure that the services are there. It's inexcusable, in my humble opinion, um, to have a son or daughter wait two years and not make that appointment to the psychiatrist. Um, and something has to be done. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Clark. I don't see any further speakers on the list, so I wouldn't mind passing the chair to Councillor Wilson just to follow up on uh, two things. Thank you. Uh, one is the issue just raised by Councillor Clark around mental health, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're, we're going to get something more specific around what's happening out there. The comments that Councillor Clark made, I think, are, um, are on the money, and they're, we all know that they're showing up in other parts of our the work that we do as not only as elected people, but I think the staff will see them in different places as well uh, in the organization. And some of the people who work, the thousands of people that work for this organization 
are also directly experiencing some of the impacts of uh, the lack of mental health services in uh, in our community. It is a problem that is province wide, as we as we know, and it is getting worse. I would agree. My question is: when we talk about children's mental health um, and our kind of responsibilities there, what what is the age uh, range of uh, the children's mental health services that we would be talking about? Children and youth, children. Director. Uh, through uh, yourself, to yourself, Mayor Horvath, thank you for the question. Through me. Oh, I beg your pardon. Through you, Councillor Wilson, to you, Mayor. Um, uh, so I'll just talk about the system a little bit. So the system in terms of services for children and youth in the mental health realm outside of public health is zero to 17. 17. Yeah, 17 years of age. They fall within um, children and youth services. When they turn 18, they fall in adult services. Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate that. My other question would be, uh, considering the struggles that our community is facing on the mental health uh, side, the trauma side, the alcohol and uh, drug addiction side, uh, some of the things that we've talked about, the, we have the plan for the, uh, um, for the uh, poison drug supply, the opioid pilot project. Uh, it seems to me that sending $9 million back to the province uh, at this point in time is extremely problematic. Uh, and so the way the report reads on page five, and I'm so glad that Councillor Jackson, uh, through you, Chair, put, uh, put that forward as an issue in terms of the money we send back. Um, the last sentence on that particular page says, uh, from January 1st to March 31st, uh, blah, 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 we spent the remaining 8,897,124 uh, dollars will be recovered by the Ministry of Health. I'm just thinking about the language there. Will be recovered. So is it just automatically a clawback? Is it just, it just doesn't show up in our next kind of installment of dollars? Is there any way that we can uh, advocate to divert that money to the uh, the present crisis uh, on so many fronts that we face as a community. Dr. Richardson. Through you, Madam Chair. So I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to channel David Trevisani at the moment, our, our finance manager. Um, so um, the way that it works with the government, with the provincial government as to their funding is they do send it to us on a regular basis. Um, and then uh, as we approach, uh, as we get through year end, then there would be the settlement process to decide what happens. What was different with COVID-19 was because they too knew there was so much uncertainty as to what would be needed, was they agreed to, share, to fund and share a certain amount of the dollars and then you know, depending on where we were at as we did quarterly reports, you know, increase that amount you know, potentially, or start to, to just say you've had it, you know, you've got enough to cover the rest of the year, it looks like. And so that adjustment process went on in year, which was unusual for us. Usually that's an end of year settlement only. So the base flowed, the COVID-19 dollars, which are the ones that were clawed back, you know, it depended on, on what was flowed. Even still, there was money that would be clawed back. That process is a regular process that we do go through with the province around our funding and you know, deciding on where it is at. There are rules that on what the funding can be spent on. The public health funding and accountability agreement is fairly long and specific in certain areas as to what the money can be used for, and it does not allow money to be used elsewhere. And is there an opportunity in that process to say, you know, could we keep dollars? Generally, they ask us um, around dollars that we might keep um, that could be kept and spent before the end of March of the following year because their fiscal year ends then and they don't generally allow any funds to be carried over beyond year end. Um, so there's usually a very small window when one might ask uh, a second time for some additional dollars or to keep some dollars uh, before that sort of automatic process uh, takes over and the money is clawed back. So at this point, that process, I believe, and this is where I wish I had Dave, um, I believe that's already happened. There wouldn't, we would be beyond that point. Uh, thank you so much uh, th uh, through you, um, 
Uh, Chair Wilson, I, I would just say that I think we need to get really uh, thoughtful and creative about how we identify funds that we can then advocate to the province um, and say, look, you had this in your books already. This was something in your books that you were going to be providing to the city of Hamilton. Um, it's time to stop doing things the way that they've always been done because the crisis that we're dealing with is not the way uh, it's always been in the city of Hamilton. And so I wouldn't mind um, through you, uh, uh, Chair Wilson, um, sitting down with whether it's David, whether it's uh, uh, Dr. Richardson, whether it's uh, uh, folks on this committee that want to have a further conversation uh, about how we make that case. We've talked in other committees about uh, the work that needs to be done to advocate to the province of Ontario and the federal government. Uh, and um, I just, I think we really, I think we've all identified that we need to ramp that up and find every opportunity possible. So I just wanted to kind of flag that. So thanks very much, Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Mayor Horvath. Back to you. Thank you for your uh, insight and in, in noting that. Um, okay, then on that note, um, I don't see any other speakers on the list. Um, Sorry, Mayor Horvath, I think Councillor Nan wishes to speak. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Nan, you're not on my screens, but you are on the big screen, so <laughs> over to you. Thank you. Through you, Mayor. Just a procedural question on the really important point that you made, Mayor, and totally trust your leadership in having that conversation with public health staff that you itemize, but is there any is there any procedural need for a motion to enable that work to be part of our uh, regular OBL for um, this committee? Just just a curiosity from the procedural perspective. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Nan. I, 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 it, it's certainly something that um, I'm happy to entertain. I would ask, though, that um, the committee maybe uh, give me an opportunity, uh, if I could hand the chair over again, um, give me the opportunity to have an, some exploratory discussions first and see what we can't map out, because this is a big animal, and we're trying to find every opportunity that we can to uh, to to change up the situation. So it's it's these funds, but there's a, a probably many, many others. So my, my office staff are seized with this, as well as the city manager's office. And I just wanted to make sure we're pulling every thread that we could. So some exploratory work perhaps first, uh, but uh, if you prefer uh, a motion, I'm, I'm happy with that as well. Thank you, three, I'm happy with that. Thanks so much. Thank you. And, and depending on where it goes, of course, um, uh, there may be value in other agencies and associations through Alpha expanding the net of that conversation. I, I trust we're not alone. Thank you, Mayor Horvath, for your leadership. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Wilson. Um, okay, so then we will go back to the report. Did you have anything further, Councillor Nan? Okay. Um, then seeing no further speakers, uh, we will then uh, go to the vote. It's um, on the electronic screen, and Councillor McMeekin is in favour. Thumbs up. Come, can, oh, thank you. That carries 12 to 0. Thanks very much, folks. We're now on to the discussion items. 10.1, uh, Mental Health Outreach Program and Hamilton Public Library Partnership. May I please have a mover and seconder to put item 10.1 on the floor? Moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Kassar. Um, are, is there any discussion on this report? Uh, Councillor Nan, please. Councillor Nan? Oh. Thank you. Sorry, it just took a That's moment okay. to toggle myself to unmute. Um, just really uh, appreciative of this program and the work uh, that's already been underway at the Central Library and this report as it itemizes the expansion of the program to meet needs um, at the Barton branch specifically. Um, this kind of collaboration between public health and the library really does uh, help the library live into its mission, but also supports the work that public health has been championing around community mental health outreach as well. Um, the question I had was regarding, um, you know, I, I am anticipating, Mayor, that there is likely going to be a clear demonstration through this program 
and what I'm hearing on the ground in terms of uh, expressed need in the community for this model of bringing social workers from public health into community spaces to help meet, meet need uh, where the need is versus having folks having to go to different locations. I'm wondering um, if I could through you to staff what is the, it, I'm not looking for like an in-depth evaluative framework, but I am curious to hear about how are we measuring the successes and learnings from this program and how we might be able to roll it out in new iterations uh, as it continues going forward. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Through to you, Chair, to the Council, uh, Julie Prieto, Director of Epidemiology and Wellness. So um, I do have Susan Boyd here, who's a program manager, who can speak to a little bit of the work that's being done. Um, but certainly, uh, Councillor, uh, we're starting to have those discussions on how best to evaluate um, the program at the Central Library um, to really uh, get a better understanding of the impact of this program um, for individuals at the community level as well. So I I don't know, Susan, if there's anything further to add. Yeah. Hi, Susan Boyd, Program Manager with the Mental Health and Street Outreach Program. Through you, Major, uh, sorry, Mayor, to the Councillor. Um, we are engaging in an initiative right now with the Community Research Platform with McMaster. So it's a partnership between uh, Public Health Services, the library, and the research platform to, um, right now we're looking at defining the framework, and then we would have to find funding to be able to put the evaluation into um, place. So that's um, active right now. Um, and then we will be looking at how to involve um, individuals who have either received uh -oh. through the program or other um, library members uh, in the process as well. Thank you. Councillor Nan. Thank you. Through you, Mary. Uh, appreciating that dual scope of evaluation and looking at impact, right, in terms of the individuals who may be, you know, may perhaps not in a moment of crisis, but in a moment of need, and perhaps not of a complex need of social and mental health, but maybe just a simple one. And so that spectrum of need in, in the work that the social workers are nimbly responding to and then being able to support the library workers to focus on their, their roles and responsibilities and also support those workers where they don't have the subject matter expertise to be able to lend that uh, deeper health-based support to, to our residents. That's one category, one very you know deep category. And then the other category is other library users and how, um, how the social worker's presence and ability to serve the need of individuals is also then impacting the presence of um, community health. I anticipate, um, you know, there might not be uh, every single moment that the social worker is needed to respond to an expressed need in the room, but there is an opportunity for the social worker to work in collaboration with the library staff to build capacity in the community through the library programming as it relates to social and mental health um, resources, referrals. Uh, do you have questions about X, Y, and Z? Are you experiencing X, Y, and Z? Here is yet another way the library system can continue acting as a hub to connect people to the services that they need. So I just wanted to hear a little bit from staff is that is that what's emerging in terms of the, the work the social workers are providing, or is it less prescriptive and um, emergent? Through the mayor to the councillor. Um, so we're doing both. The volume at Central Library has been quite high, so the direct service demand has been has definitely put us at capacity and at times above. But the other piece that we have been able to do is do exactly what you've been um, describing is to work with library staff. So library staff will send our staff members questions, um, maybe about resources in the community, how to connect people. So we're able to provide them that information. So what it does is our program sort of approach um, our partnerships through a capacity building uh, approach. So it builds capacity within the library staff that if somebody comes in the next time, it's maybe a straightforward question about a resource, they can then provide that. So we have been able to do both, but the priority has been the direct, uh, the direct service. Thank you. Happy to support the recommendations before us. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Councillor Nan. Uh, Councillor Maureen Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. I know this subject has been um, on our uh, docket previously, but we uh, earlier this morning had a very necessary and important conversation about mental health. And um, I think there is value, in my opinion, if I could ask two questions. If I could ask through the Chair for just another um, overview of uh, how this is being played out within the library. What is, what is the service being offered? Um, uh, who is up taking the, the service and, and, and what, what does it look like? Um, because I think uh, as an unabashed lover of libraries, it is a domain of uh, such inclusiveness at a time of um, a lot of public uh, demonstrations of acuities of need where doors are closing, but the library continues to open its doors. So if you could just, for the public who are listening, could you just describe how this is working? Through the chair. Thank you. Please go ahead. Through the mayor to the councillor. So we have um, one social worker on site at the central library, and it's split up into two staff to make up the one FTE. Um, we provide services from Monday to Saturday. And so the services work in that there's drop-in hours that are posted. So if somebody's coming to the, using the library and they look it up, they can just stop by the social worker's office on the drop-in time. Um, also, we could get referrals from library staff about somebody who's come in that we'll then follow up with. Um, and so the service has been very broad and diverse because the needs have been very broad and diverse. And so. Um, it's individual service that's provided and we have helped, pe or sorry, the staff in the program have helped people with immediate sort of acute needs. So that could be around a mental health crisis, it could be around a housing crisis, um, it could be around, uh, we've unfortunately had people who have come in who have experienced violence uh, and need support. So there's that work that's being done. There's also more what we would call case management support. So somebody might come in who's having difficulty accessing income supports, uh, managing housing issues, and the staff will help them with that. And then the other uh, type of support that the staff will provide is referrals. So if somebody's coming in and it's something that's not within our sort of scope, and then we'll help connect people to um, other resources in the community. Well, isn't that just brilliant? I mean, it's brilliant. It is, um, it's a coterminous, uh, a place of a, a public house uh, seeking to open its door and provide um, a no judgment helpful uh, pathway and runway um, for so many needs. In and of itself, excluding this, the library is also a place uh, for mental health because you get to see your neighbors, you get to connect into the internet where so much information is provided for those who, who don't have these devices at home. Um, we have an epidemic of lonely, loneliness. We're opening our doors to people who are increasingly being precluded uh, from spots in this city. So I'm very, very appreciative of that overview. It's um, amazing. And I think you said, uh, I just wanna make sure I'm clear on the, the ask of, uh, is it the 0.4 FTE? That is to extend this service to, to Barton? I, I would like to, make sure I'm clear on the, the report. Thank you, Chair, and those are my questions. Thank you. Please go ahead. Through the Mayor to the Councillor, um, that is correct. The library has approached us about uh, two days a week at Barton Street for a pilot for four months, up to four months. Thanks, Councillor Wilson. Uh, thanks very much, Sue. I guess, uh, I don't see, uh, oh, I, no, that's right. I don't see anybody else. I thought it said Alex Wilson on there, but it doesn't. Um, so we'll then, I want to say thank you very much for the, uh, for the report and for the, uh, the responses and for the questions from the committee members. We'll now go to the electronic vote on the report. Thumbs up, sorry, for Councillor Mimikin. That passes 13 to zero, thanks very much all. Uh, we now are on to 10.3, the Public Health Services Organizational Risk Management Plan. Um, 
I'm sorry, are we on two? Oh, I, did I scoop? I did skip over. Uh, 10.2, supervised consumption site evaluation framework. Thanks, Councillor Francis. That's a biggie. Um, can I get a mover and seconder to put that on the, on the table, please, on the floor? Uh, moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Clark. Uh, we have Councillor Nan and then Councillor Danko. Please go ahead, Councillor Nan. Thank you, through you, Mayor. Uh, thank you to the staff team who led the work and developed the framework that's uh, in front of us today. Um, I have a couple of comments and then questions, um, particularly speaking to the value of the recommended work and resourcing as being critical, especially in the face of so much misunderstanding out in the pu general public about the deep health value of consumption treatment service sites, um, especially in an area era when uh, being evidence-based and fact-based gets dismissed, it's really important to demonstrate why and how these kinds of services are so essential in getting folks through their addiction journeys towards um, being able to be contributive and most importantly, stay alive. Um, that said, in terms of community input and feedback we've heard from residents, community safety remains being the largest general concern expressed by residents as it relates to the operation of consumption treatment sites in communities. And that feedback has been also inclusive of the lack of public information related to um, CTSs and other drug strategy initiatives, addiction supports and services that operate across the city. So I really do see, Mayor, this as being a key step towards directly addressing those concerns in the community and being accountable um, as a city as a whole of the operations of CTSs um, and these life-saving uh, life services. So I, I just wanted to hear from staff about um, how the community safety concerns are integrated into this evaluative framework. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Nan. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, I do have Melissa Vixa here, Program Manager, who can uh, assist with those questions. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name? It's Melissa Vixa. Oh, Vixa, thank you. Thanks, you, Melissa. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Through you, Madam Mayor, to the Councillor, thank you for the question. So specifically, as you underscore, Councillor Nan, uh, we do hear a number of items related to community safety. So when bringing forward the evaluation framework, we've uh, proposed a number of metrics, but I would also asterisk this by you know, really highlighting in the report is that uh, there's still additional important work to do uh, for this framework, which is ongoing engagement uh, with the site operators, um, persons uh, who are using substances and other community members. Specifically around um, community safety, uh, what we frequently uh, hear reports of are around um, use around the site, around, we have metrics around drug um, litter. That's frequently a concern that's highlighted around community safety. Um, you'll see in the appendix, there's also um, highlighting around involvement of police services. So any provincially approved CTS site does have to report to the ministry on a monthly basis the number of times police uh, are called. I would say we, when we've had conversations both as a team as well as, well as with um, site operators, I think this is a metric specifically that needs uh, further discussion with communities because we want to really understand and put forward a metric that is evaluating community and safety and you know not one that's inadvertently perpetuating stigma or is not really related to the site as an ongoing community and neighborhood uh, concern. I would say, um, while you, those would be, are the two that we've put forward with community safety, but I think in another important part that is being put forward as part of this, as indicated in the community health and well-being, is a proposed community survey and an involvement with uh, community members, so not only site users, but also uh, members of the neighborhood community, uh, local BIAs around the ongoing impact of the site. What we've learned from other neighboring um, jurisdictions 
jurisdictions um, is really that ongoing uh, engagement pre and during operation of the surrounding community is really essential to the success of any site and work that um, through a number of recent initiatives that we're trying, uh, including this report and the uh, supervised consumption uh, engagement framework that we've recently put forward uh, is working to continue to support in our community. Thank you for that response through you, Mayor. Um, one of the pieces that I really appreciated in touring a couple of CTSs in other cities was that pre-point that you just uh, made um, in terms of what were the uh, initial concerns of the community or per the perceived issues that would um, that residents were concerned would manifest, and then the truth of the matter, right? Like so, once operations were underway, um, that information informing the operator, the agency, how to mitigate those concerns and and to embed those mitigation um, approaches, measures, actions directly into. Uh, their operations. And the result being, though the community had very legitimate, very uh, specific concerns, that through an ongoing dialogue, they were able to be met and more importantly, um, didn't manifest when the doors opened. So really, really want to uh, underscore that necessity of getting that pre-scan and post-operations piece done. Um, Mayor, the other question I had was, uh, you know, the, there is an ask here for um, investment moving forward, which I, I support because this work is critical. It's part, it supports our drug strategy and most importantly supports us uh, being a good public health um, uh, agency <laughs> in the city uh, by taking on our work um, in terms of evaluating not only impact but outcome. Um, could staff please comment on is the province not supporting or resourcing this kind of evaluative work for each of the agencies um, compared to like the necessity of public health, Hamilton Public Health having to take this on? Thank you. Melissa? Yeah, through you, Madam Mayor, to the councillor. Um, thank you for the question. So I, um, for, so short answer, no, um, for like, there is no province wide evaluation of supervised consumption as, a, as an intervention. Uh, as I referenced in the earlier question, a provincially approved consumption and treatment services site, so those are sites that are funded directly by the province, they do have monthly indicators that they do have to report to the province. Um, they're publicly available on the CTS website and are, and are very operational in nature, number of you know, site visits, um, number of overdoses. I would say the local CTS Hamilton uh, Urban Core does uh, produce a monthly web, uh, a monthly fact sheet of these indicators on their website. Um, the province doesn't summarize or, or, or further publicize this information. Um, the other provincially uh, collected data, I would say, is uh, local consumption and treatment site uh, inspections. Uh, so um, public health units are required to inspect them on a yearly or a complaint-based uh, process and uh, our um, infection prevention and outbreak team manages that within public health services and those are reported on our dashboard. Um, other operating sites, so I'll reference the um, urgent public health needs site at Carol Ann's place. Again, that is doesn't receive provincial dollars, so they just have to report metrics uh, to the federal government, and that's just at the time of closure. It's not on a routine um, reporting. So I would say with this uh, evaluative framework that is proposed, we are seeking to evaluate supervised consumption sites as an intervention alone. So we are not looking to provide individual evaluations of each of the sites and directly compare, but on the impact of supervised consumption, so aggregating all of the site data together uh, to really speak from a community perspective. Thank you, uh, through you, Mayor. So that last piece there, aggregated versus segregated, um, would the, is, and, and appreciating that this is yet to be uh, completed in terms of formalizing the framework, um, is would we still get a sense of the community impact 
to the geographic area that those services are available. Through you, Madam, oh, through you, Madam Mayor, to the Councillor. Um, apologies, just for clarity, I'm just going to paraphrase to ensure I understood. So are you uh, saying that the proposed evaluative framework would go further than what's currently reported to the province? Is that... No, through you, just to clarify, you mentioned um, kind of giving more of the uh, citywide data versus uh, site specific, and you know there there would definitely be interest and concern interest in the community to get more of the geographic specific impacts of the services being in operation. Um, so, like there is value in having information come back from this framework, evaluative framework that says urban core when it is in its new site and in operation in Ward Three the community impact has been X in the context of the larger citywide impact as well. Lisa? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to the Councillor, thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, yes, I, I, I would say two things. One, the value of this evaluative framework is that it does go further than what is is currently being reported to the province or to the federal government, so will provide us a better understanding of community level impacts. Um, I would say, you know, through I think a lot of that community safety data would directly come from the survey that needs to be provided, and I think we could look at that from a fine. Uh, look at that from a finding presentation perspective while currently just continuing to weigh um, the impact of, of the impact of results on community. So I agree. I think we take that point back and keep it as part of the development of the survey moving forward. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Councillor Nan. Thanks, Melissa. I appreciate that. Uh, we now have uh, Councillor Danko. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, um, I really appreciate the questions from, uh, from Councillor Nan. I, I know she really does genuinely care about uh, the community and, and raising that front and center. Um, but to be completely honest uh, today, I'm having a real trouble with the evaluative framework that's before us. And I think we have to acknowledge the tragic murder in Toronto of a young woman, a mother, that was directly linked to a safe consumption site. And just recently learning that also an employee of that safe consumption site being linked to that murder, um, allegedly. And the residents in that community consistently bringing up issues with drug dealing, illegal and visible drug use, aggressive behavior, used needles, drug paraphernalia, warning of violence, warning somebody was going to be killed, and all of those concerns being ignored because, well, we can't stigmatize anybody. So the evaluative framework, when I read the report that's before us, it focuses on community partners, aka advocacy groups. It focuses on the actual drug users. It focuses on working groups, people associated with uh, the safe consumption sites. But there's really nothing formally in there about the actual community that's going to be impacted by this. You know, the actual residents, the businesses, the BIAs, the property owners. And, you know, through Councillor Nan's questions, you know, I did hear further discussion with community. But to be honest, I, I'm not sure I can, I can support the evaluative framework without formalizing, centering it on the community and not the site itself. So those are my comments. I don't know if staff has a response, uh, but that's just the, the what I'm struggling with right now. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Danko. I do see Melissa turned her mic on. I think that means she, she wanted to add something, so thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah, through you, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Danko. Thank you for your uh, question, Councillor. And so, yes, I would say the community health and well-being arm of the framework um, around this, I would say, survey design that we've spoke to and the report briefly mentions around further engagement with community organization working and working groups. That's intended to be um, local residents, BIAs, in addition to, um, to individuals using the services. I would also, um, also continue to 
uh, refer back that um, one of the earlier comments around, you know, site setup and site design and um, community consultation prior to the initiation of a site um, is that one of the key principles is around setting up of community advisory tables uh, that meet, that is, you know, initiated at time of application, as well as continue to meet throughout the operation. And ideally, those community advisory committees um, have members of, you know, local residents or BIAs or business owners, as well as users of the site that continue to come together and proactively address the issue, any issues arising, or so again, start at the beginning from time of application and any issues through operation. And in um, as well, really as a best practice for the site, and our hope is um, also uh, that survey would in involve um, survey and using those community advisory groups to continue to understand the impact uh, of the site moving forward. Councillor Jaco. Thank you, and I really do appreciate that. And I, I again, just in how the report is written, we don't spell that out. So I, I really do appreciate hearing that from staff, that that is the intention, but it's almost like we're afraid of actually hearing from residents that might be critical. And because of that, those voices get drowned out. Um, so I, I appreciate staff, I will take that at face value, and I do, understand and appreciate the value of safe consumption sites as a necessary health care for the opioid crisis, but we can't ignore um, you know, issues when they come up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Danko. Councillor Clark, please. Thank you, Chair Horvath. I am struggling with the Appendix A because I don't think it's really a scope that would be provided to a new employee to examine or what their job will be. It is almost at, what's that expression, at the 30,000 foot level or whatever it is, rather than what the actual scope of the work will be. So is there an additional document that defines the scope of the work of this coordinator. Thanks, Councillor Clark. Melissa? Through you, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Clark. Uh, so, Councillor, thank you for your question. Um, again, this uh, evaluative framework was, at the Appendix A, was provided as a high-level overview or proposal of what the evaluation would move forward. As part of operational planning, um, and if this, position is approved, so we would um, work with a job description, work with HR and creation of the job description, and then uh, as the manager of the program would work uh, to onboard the individual and work uh, to define and further provide more information on the evaluative framework, create uh, project charters engage with the community around the development uh, of this moving forward. So yes, certainly this is in very high level, but from an operational planning perspective, um, more details uh, would be made available to the employee. Thank you, Councillor Clark. I, think, I guess that's a bit of a challenge for me because it feels like we're approving some from something that is operationally blind at this moment. And, you know, when we bring in consultants, we provide a scope of work. Uh, we understand the scope of work. And I'm not sure this does that. Um, equally, I'm concerned, as Councillor Danko has mentioned, and Councillor Nan, and Councillor Nan is, uh, you know, her community is living with this. Um, I don't have a good understanding of what the impacts are. I hear anecdotal stories about negative impacts to the community, and then I hear the other side saying, nope, that's not an issue. And I'm stuck in the middle trying to understand whether or not we are doing the proper thing. I believe in the process of preventing drug poisoning, 
I believe in the process and the opportunity that CTSs provide to have that conversation between the drug user and staff because at some point, almost every drug user hits the wall and says, okay, I, I think I need help. And if we're not there when that happens, it, 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 there's no opportunity um, for rehab services. So I'm a little bit frustrated because there is insufficient scope here to understand what that money is going to purchase and what that coordinator is actually going to be doing. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Clark. Uh, there's always an opportunity for uh, members of committee to uh, to look at whether we've covered all the bases in our co governance role in terms of what something looks like uh, so that we uh, can understand that we've taken all of the governance kind of pieces and put them in place uh, and ha so that we have some further confidence. Uh, although the actual operation, oper operationalization only took me two tries. Operationalization of the actual work on the ground is something that uh, that we, we leave to staff. However, uh, I think it's pretty clear that this is uh, uncharted territory in terms of our uh, work to try to evaluate and create some of the um, some of the data and some of the evaluation, some of the uh, the engagement that is uh, that is necessary as we as we try to to uh, uh, pull together a response to the crisis that's happening in our community in a way that not only addresses the, the folks in that crisis uh, in terms of use of, of the site, but also the community neighborhood and the residents uh, uh, around around the site. So uh, I, I do appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Clark? And to be clear, Chair, I'm not trying to insert myself into the operationalization of this project. I'm trying to understand what this expenditure that we are being asked to spend is actually going to do. What is the scope of the job that that coordinator is going to be asked to do? This is a new program that we're now trying to evaluate and what is before us does not provide me sufficient information to make that decision, respectfully. Uh, that's... Um Oh, uh, uh, Dr. Richardson, please. Through you, Mayor, as I'm, I'm uh, appreciate the discussion and and trying to understand the gap, um, envisioning that, you know, is that a gap that can be closed today in terms of under that understanding, or is that a gap that that committee would like us to return and, and describe further? And so, when I look at page six of six. Um, it does outline the work of that program evaluation coordinator. This is a well-established position within the, the uh, within public health services. They do we do have two other program evaluation coordinators at this time who would undertake very similar work um, in the design uh, uh, and execution of program evaluations. What is novel in this case is. Um, that this is an area that's not typically public health to do, and so they will be more of a leader in this in the province in terms of this work, and so connecting with others that are um, experts in this field, other researchers and, and whatnot, will be a key part of it. But the, the job of the evaluation coordinator is to do that survey design, the valid, validating the kinds of measures we use against others, um, in this case, they will also be engaging with those community partners that Melissa has discussed um, and talking about, you know, what is in the survey, what's, what do they want to see, what do they want to do. They'll be doing the same with the site operators. And ultimately, it will be their job to move through to the production of reports and, uh, and to be reporting back um, and making recommendations, further taking that information. We know that just providing information doesn't lead to it being taken up or to changes that result from it. So they work through and do the work um, to make it accessible to people, all the levels of people who will be consuming it, whether that's this committee, um, the, uh, the public, the operators, et cetera, um, and doing that in coordination with the, the program manager and other program staff who do this work. So, 
it would help to understand, you know, is this, is this set, that explanation what is looking for? Is there a further gap that would need to be filled um, to, in order to help with this? Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Richardson. I, I found that uh, quite um, helpful, uh, particularly identifying that the that there is a kind of a way that this work gets done through other programs, but this is a new program, and uh, so we're we're trying to tease that out. Councillor Clark, I just want to go back to you to see if that information was helpful, or if there's something you might identify that remains uh, a gap, as uh, Dr. Richardson uh, mentioned. I heard the community partners. I heard the site operators. I did not hear the community. That's the gap. That's what Councillor Nan raised early on. And it's not there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you wanted to put a motion. That's certainly in order uh, in, uh, when the time comes. In the meantime, we do have other speakers on the list. So I'll leave that with you. Maybe you and Councillor Nan may want to work on something. Um, but uh, I don't know that there's anything else that staff can respond to. I think the issue has been um, discussed, so perhaps there is a motion uh, or an amendment. Um, uh, Councillor Tattison, please. I want to thank Dr. Richardson. I like that direction that you're posing right there about looking at that gap that exists. Um, in regards to community level impacts, Right now, we, I believe in this area, we have a public relations crisis. Currently this morning, local radio hosts perpetuating stigma, fear-mongering, exploitation, sensationalization of tragic events that do happen. Um, they're making statements that consumption sites are locations where drug dealers are getting safe supply from users. Um, they're saying that consumption sites staff care more about what goes on inside their doors than what happens outside in the community. We may know differently, but we need to look at research, like you said, that counters that to get a bigger overall picture of community impact. So. If Councillor Clark is willing to put something forward to give direction to, pu to public health and this board, I would support that as well. So thank you, and again, thank you for your learned answers, Dr. Richardson. It's always a pleasure to hear and understand better how complex all these issues are. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tattison. Um, I'm sorry, I don't see anybody else on the screen. I can't hear what you're saying, Jessica. I, I don't, oh, oh Councillor uh, Maureen Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair, Mayor Horvath. Um, what I'm, I'm looking on uh, page five of the actual report, um, the four, overarching domains proposed for the evaluation have been based on the following um, site usage, community safety. Um, and a community is, I think, necessarily broadly defined because this is what this is all about. It's, it's about um, the community. It's about the users and the, the, uh, those who are dependent. It's uh, the public health community. Uh, and then I go down further into the report. Um, understanding the community impact would be done through engagement with community partners, individuals who use the site and any working groups. And I, I thought I heard explicitly from um, Melissa, and pardon me for using your first name rather than your title, um, that, that, that answered that concern of who is community, its neighborhood. But um, in order to uh, respond to uh, a legitimate question and concern from the floor, I'm, I'm just wondering if there has to be an explicit statement that the community includes uh, the neighborhood and the residents and any of those persons 
who wish to participate uh, informally or formally with respect to the, the working groups, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Wilson. Um, I don't see any further speakers on the, oh, Councillor Clark. So I really appreciate Councillor Maureen Wilson's uh, commentary there. Uh, what I'm looking at, and, and, uh, and I think her advice is sound. When I'm looking at page six of six, and it would be just above alternatives for consideration. To operationalize the framework and support this new portfolio of work, um, the position is recommended. The position will support operationalize the framework, survey design, validation of metrics, engagement with community partners, site and site operators, production of reports, recommendations, and any not yada yada. Nowhere in there is there engagement with the public or the local community. And, the, and, and Council Wilson is, that's exactly what my concern is, and I think what I heard from Council Ann, that's what her concern is. So we need to somehow ensure that that is there. So even if it was added in this document here, and I'm not sure we can actually change a report, I think we have to change recommendations, not the report itself, but we need to include um, community engagement so that we can understand what is happening on the ground. Can uh, I have, hear from Dr. Richardson in terms of how I could do that? She's about to do exactly that, Councillor Clark. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Richardson, please. Th through you, Mary. Indeed, you know, and that's very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, it, we could add to the A recommendation that the supervised consumption site evaluation framework um, attached as Appendix A and uh, with, with the inclusion of explicit community consultation, or the, you don't need the word explicit, but with, and with the inclusion of community consultation um, to this be approved, would be my suggestion. If clerks, Matt, thinks that that's a legitimate way of framing it. I, I, I could support that. I'm looking to, and I'm sorry, Councilor Nat, I didn't mean, but. I was hearing what you're saying, and I'm hearing the same thing from from residents who are are worried about this. Um, does that make sense? I'd like to hear from the ward council. Please. Sure, Councillor Clark, and I, I would I just ask to think about the word community and whether that's inclusive enough to mm -hmm. to uh, you know provide your your comfort. Uh, so, did, uh, can we put a motion up, maybe, and then we can maybe uh, work on it? Yeah, I I I, I would suggest uh, local community engagement. Um, not necessary consultation, but there has to be some ability to hear from people and understand what they're experiencing. Okay, Clerk Ote, can you put something up that might, might help the uh, the committee land on on an appropriate on appropriate? I'd language? be happy to second it if Councillor Nan's comfortable uh, moving it because it's her community that's experiencing this. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, so we, I appreciate that, uh, uh, Clerk Ote. So we have. The language in front of you reads, uh, with an addition after the Board of Health, uh, um, the, the report identifier, uh, and it says, and with the inclusion of local community engagement be approved. Uh, and so this is a, an amendment. I don't. I can't see Councillor Nan on the screen anymore because we now have the motion there. I don't know if she's uh, prepared to be the person to move. Um, is that the case? Thank you, Councillor Nan. Appreciate that. And Councillor Clark is seconding. Uh, so let's have um, a discussion on the uh, on the amendment. I think Councillor Wilson had her hand up a, a moment ago. No. Okay, Councillor Alex Wilson, please. Just one quick question. I'm seeking to understand if this is just an exercise in clarity for the public, which I'm okay with, but understanding like this seems to be the intention of staff originally. So there's not an operational change. This is just a rhetorical clarity based piece. Great. I'm seeing that from the bench. I just wanted to understand what we are, if we are changing the operations or if we are making clear what was the intent originally from yeah. staff. So thank you. It nods ahead around the staff saying that yes, in fact, that's the case. Councillor Wilson, thanks for clarifying that. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Councillor Clark, Councillor Wilson, Councillor Nan, Councillor Danko, uh, all of the uh, voices, Councillor Tattison, uh, that um, helped us tease this out and, and make it more um, comfortable for everyone. Uh, we'll go to the vote then. Uh, moved by Councillor Nan and seconded by Councillor Clark, the amen amendment as indicated. Um, the vote is up.
Uh, Councillor McMeekin is in favour. Thumbs up. That carries uh, 12 to 1. Uh, so thanks very much, everybody, for, for that. We are then on to the main uh, motion or the remainder of the recommendation, um, which would be the Part B, I guess, included. Um, can I get a mover and seconder? Oh, we had a mover and seconder already, so we can get the vote up for that, please. Thank you to all the staff as well. Thank you. Vote is up. Uh, that carries 12 to 1 as well. Thanks so much, everyone. Important, important discussion. Um, we are now then on to item 10.3. So may I have a, a mover and seconder, uh, please, to put item um, 10.3 on the floor. Moved by Councillor Tattison, second by Councillor Huang. Uh, is there any discussion on the report? Oh, uh, Councillor Maureen Wilson, please. Thank you, Mayor Horvath. Um, I just have a... <laughs> A comment to make um, and it directly pertains to um, my reference to communication item 5.6 uh, the there are two risks as I understand it identified in this report and I think we have to be really clear that uh, the risk is real um, and public health uh, is dependent on uh, boots on the ground uh, in order for us to meet our are the mandate of this committee and the goal of public health and funding matters. And uh, if I recall the report itself, it, it, it references outright those risks. So I, I, think, um, it's an, I think it's an important framing, in my opinion, um, to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Wilson. I don't see any further speakers to the report, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll go to a vote then. The vote is up. Thank you very much. Councillor McMeekin, thumbs up. That carries 13 to 0. Um, I don't see any uh, motions or notices of motion, but uh, so items 11 and 12 uh, we skip over. But item 13, general information, other business, I, I turn to Councillor Clark, who had something he wanted to raise. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Horvath. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, just a brief um, update to my colleagues around this table. Uh, the Stony Creek Regional um, Facility, which is the GFL non-hazardous ICI landfill, has had a crisis now since the spring. The odors coming off of the facility are atrocious. They are 24-7, they have been non-stop. You have to gamble on where the wind is going to blow for your backyard barbecue to decide whether or not you can go outside and have company. The residents have been really impacted by this. They have been advocating non-stop to the ministry. I have had the support of Mayor Horvath and the support of our city manager in communications, um, the mayor to the minister, the city manager to the deputy minister. I have been in constant contact with the local district office. I have encourages, encouraged residents to file complaints to all of the above. The odor continues this morning, it was horrendous. I am being asked by residents um, if it is safe, I don't know how to respond. And so I'd like to ask Dr. Richardson, and, and before I do, uh, to be clear, these odors are so pervasive and strong that they are impacting my esteemed colleague in Ward 5 and his residents. They are also suffering from this odor. So is there a way 
of monitoring the air to tell us what is in the odors so that we can hopefully reassure residents uh, that although the odors are nasty, there is no immediate health impact. Can I hear from Dr. Richardson? Thanks, please? Councillor Clark. Dr. Richardson, please. <coughs> Through you, Mayor, to, uh, to Councillor Clark. So in the case of the, the landfill, as I've been talking with Matt Lawson, who's here with us this morning for Kevin, um, the, my understanding is it is the, the um, exposure of the older parts of the landfill that is leading to a lot of the odors that are being experienced. And, you know, the, in, in looking at... Um, whether we can, there can be some testing to reassure residents. I know there's been, you know, experts from the Ministry of Environment, and Conservation, and Parks, and people who've been involved who have, have tried to give reassurances. But I understand very much so as people are experiencing it, um, that that really seeing some objective test data as opposed to just the reassurances really helps people, and being to accept, being able to accept the issues of odor vis-a-vis, -vis, um, um, you know, what might be in that from an air standpoint. So one would need to look at what was in that site, what might be expected from that site, and certainly the Ministry of Environment and Conservation Parks are have the ex significant expertise in that regard, um, and you know could assist us in in looking at what would we want to test for because it's it's very difficult to just test everything when it comes to air quality. So you want to be specific and look for the things that you think might be of concern. Um, so we can certainly um, work to to look at what testing could be done. That would be we don't, of course, have the testing equipment that would have to be done by another organization that would be contracted with in order to do that, or to look to the Ministry of Environment, Conservation, and Parks to do that. And um, you know, we too have relationships there that we can turn to. And I'll just uh, look to Matt to add any detail that he thinks might be helpful today um, around this issue. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Through Madam Mayor to Councillor Clerk, uh, in addition to the comments provided by Dr. Richardson, um, I have been in contact also with uh, the Stony Creek Regional Facility General Manager as well as the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks local staff, uh, local office staff, and um, with the Ministry of uh, Environment, Conservation and Parks staff will be reviewing um, the odor management plan that applies to the facility to see where, if at all, there are any uh, gaps in what they are supposed to be doing. These guidelines were published in 2021. They're available through the website. And um, further to that, we'll be looking at uh, trying to identify, as Dr. Richardson mentioned, what chemicals may be most likely causing the odors to see if there can be a quantification. And um, we'll take it forward with ministry staff and their expertise about how to identify those. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you for that. And I, I appreciate that. And, and I, I want my, my colleagues to understand the psychosocial impacts that the residents have been experiencing who have been enduring these odors. 75% to 80% of the winds that are blowing come from the southwest. So the neighbors who are in the Empire Victory uh, communities, um, those are the folks that are enduring this nonstop. And the psychosocial impacts, uh, it, it's really impacting their mental health. You know, um, and quite candidly, uh, the comments from the Ministry of Environment uh, is not providing any solace to the community. They're worried about what they're breathing. Um, I'm frustrated because in my communications with ministry staff, Initially, they were a little bit flippant with me. They talked about, well, wh what do you expect? They, they live next to a landfill and the city approved the, the developments. I can't tell you my response, but it was somewhat unpleasant. <laughs> and 
it infuriates me to hear that kind of commentary and I want the ministry to take it seriously and I want them um, to work with our staff here at Public Health to do air monitoring. Um, the dust monitoring is not sufficient. We need to understand what is in that air and that odor and understand what the impacts are. And, and I think if our public health department is involved, it, it will provide more comfort to that community because at this moment, and I don't mean to disparage the ministry, but they don't believe the ministry. And they don't believe the company. And quite candidly, I think at times, watching their faces, they don't believe me. And it's that lack of trust that is re really building some significant psychosocial impacts to those residents. So I'm looking to our staff. I, I, I think it would be important that this public health board request that um, uh, our public men, medical officer health, associate medical officer health, write to the ministry and to request that that type of air monitoring be done, uh, to be involved in that process as that independent third party. Is that something that Dr. Richardson and Dr. Lawson would be comfortable with? Thanks, Councillor Clark. Dr. Richardson? Through you, Mary. Yes, be comfortable with that as a, as a motion that could be made and for um, myself you. and for Manager Lawson to, uh, to move forward with that request. I mean, Manager Lawson will move forward with it in the meantime as that is ratified through Council, but uh, to have that formally as well would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, so uh, then I uh, <coughs> would, I guess at this point, uh, move a motion that the Board of Health request, I can't even speak English these days, request that um, our public health staff write to the Ministry of Environment and yada yada, I'm not sure what the yada yadas are anymore, they keep changing their name, um, that, that we are re requesting air monitoring be conducted to verify what is in the odor to reassure residents. Um, I think something to that, I'm, I'm looking to our staff and our clerk, is that, are we in the ballpark here? Uh, Dr. Richardson? Through you, Mayor, I think, uh, you know, as, as the city's looked at in terms of its own strategic priorities for this term of council, I think part of the concept is that, that those results be shared with the transparency component, be sh the results themselves be transparently shared with um, the, the surrounding community and, uh, and, and discussed. Did you capture that, Matthew? Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Clerk. We now have something on the screen. I'm going to read it out loud. I'm not sure how easy it is for folks online to um, to pull it up. So that the Public Health Committee requests that the Public Health staff write to Ministry of Environment to the Ministry of Environment requesting air monitoring be conducted, conducted to verify what is in the odor and the results of the monitoring be shared with the surrounding community. Um, maybe uh, the odor emanating from the GFL landfill site in Ward, what's Nine. your ward number again, 11? Nine. Nine, sorry. Don't give me more work than I have. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Ward 9. Just so that we're, we're specific about where it is that we want the monitoring. Thank you. Oops, Councillor Francis will be second again. First, first, we would have to um, introduce, a, introduce, introduce a motion to waive the rules to introduce the motion, okay. since it's not on the agenda. So we'll do that first. Please. Okay. Can we get a mover to um, uh, waive the rules? Moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded, oh, well, moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor uh, Doesn't Clark? matter. We can let, we can let, oh, it's, that's fine. Uh, can we get a vote up on that, unless there's any debate? Thank you. Oh, my mic is still on. My apologies. Uh, 
Uh, Councillor Nunn, your name is up on the speaker's list. Is that to debate the waiving of the rules? Oh, my apologies. Not the waiving of the rules. It's on the main motion. Okay, thank you. Councillor McMeekin, are you in favor? Councillor Count McMeekin doesn't seem to be on the screen anymore. Yeah, and Councillor Kretsch. Just waiting on your vote. Thank you. Yes, he's in favor. I'll mark Councillor McMeekin absent. That carries 13 to 0. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so then we have the motion in front of us. Uh, moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Francis on this item. Is uh, there any further discussion, Councillor Nan? Thank you, through you, Mayor. Just wanted to get clarity on the wording in the motion says, what is in the odor? And I apologize, Councillor Clark, if I missed the point earlier in, in your uh, raising of the issue. Is it specifically chemical compound that you're looking for? I'm just trying to get insight on the request as we've had this issue quite often in Ward 3 and have made similar requests directly as a councillor's office to the ministry. So I just wanted to get a little bit of clarity there. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Councillor Nan. I'm, I'm certain that Councillor Clark can, can clarify. Uh, thank you for that, um, Chair Horvath and, and uh, to Councillor Nan. So the landfill is a non-hazardous industrial and commercial landfill. They really don't take any institutional waste. It is highly regulated and they really do know what materials have been placed into the landfill. The question now is, as I understand it, there's two issues, one is leachate and the other is they were building a brand new cell to the landfill, so they dug material from the bottom of the landfill, placed it on top of the landfill to ensure a safe workplace for the workers so that there was no risk of landslide with the vibrations that were going on at the bottom of the landfill. The problem is that material is saturated with leachate and as the hot days come, it evaporates, and that evaporation carries the odors and any chemical compounds that are in the materials. So it really is chemical compounds. We don't know what it is. We know roughly what it could be. Um, and I hope that answers the question. Uh, for the Councillor Nan, please go ahead. It does. Thank you, and happy to support the motion. Thanks very much. Uh, we have Councillor Kassar, please. Yeah, fully supportive of the motion and as is dealing with the potential negative consequences or impact to health, totally support that. Just a, a question, even if there is no impact, there's still the odor and just a, a question then to Councillor Clark on for public consumption on any other steps that are being taken to actually deal with the odor because there is still significant as you mentioned, psychosocial impacts, even if there is nothing harmful in the compound itself. Councillor Clark, please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor, and I, I appreciate Councillor Kazari's question. Um, so uh, the mayor has been working with the minister's office and the minister directly. The city manager has been working with the deputy minister. My understanding where we stand currently today is that the district office has ordered um, a cease to the cell construction. So no more material is being moved from the bottom to the top. They have ordered that the leachate be drained from the leachate pond, which it has been done and it has been flushed with clean groundwater. The company was then proceeding to release them into the sewer system directly, um, which triggered an increase in the complaints downstream because the vapors are coming out of the sewer and um, directly up into neighborhoods in uh, the Ward 5 councillors area. So that has stopped. Uh, the, comp the ministry has um, indicated that they're to remove the leachate by truck um, 
the company is indicating that the increase in rain that we have had has compounded the challenge. And I'm not sure if any of that at the moment is resolving the issue with regards to the odors. And so you're correct, the, the, the impacts on the residents. You can't imagine um, every single day going to bed and then getting up and having that odor outside. It's not something that you get used to. It gags you in your throat. Um, it can be acrid. We have a sports park up there and I get numerous complaints from soccer coaches and parents that their kids are playing with that odor in the air and I don't have answers as to what is in the odor. And so I'm hoping that this will help us understand what's going on while the mayor and I continue our advocacy to the government to take responsibility and deal with this. Thank you. Uh, that's fine, Councillor Kassar. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. I don't see any other speakers on the list, um, so we'll go to a vote, and I just wanna say to Councillor Clark, you've been working very hard on this, and I'm um, looking forward to working with you to, to try to get some resolution. Uh, so, um, we'll go to a vote then, please. It's up, and we'll ask people to identify. Uh, Councillor McMeekin is in favor. Thank you. That carries 14 to zero, thanks very much. Um, so that uh, takes us to the end of our agenda. Oh no, Councillor Jackson, sorry, you did identify that you had uh, another piece of information or other business, please go ahead. Thanks, Mayor Horvath. I just thought it was timely if we could shift gears over to vermits and rats and pests. Um, uh, if I could just get an update, I just thought the timing of today's meeting in light of the media reports and Mayor Horvath, I can't thank you enough for chiming in in a stern manner in terms of the overall concern from people who have to deal with rats and pests, both within their neighborhoods, within their homes, within multi-residential complexes. Uh, just before I get to my question to either Dr. Richardson or Acting Director Matt Lawson for a, a complete update as to resources that will be reinstated and how soon we can get at the backlog. I thought for a while that my office over the last year was the only one that was um, inundated with these type of complaints and forwarding them on to public health. And I, I, there was no bigger supporter, I think, from the other than the Ward 6 office during the pandemic for all the great work and redeployment public health services did to get us through that pandemic as well as they did. However, I found over the last year, I was getting a standard response. My staff and I were very frustrated. We we're getting a standard response that Councillor Jackson, I'm paraphrasing, due to the fact that uh, redeployment has still occurred and we may or may not be out of the COVID-19 pandemic yet. And you know, so uh, these type of services, uh, and enforcement and investigating rat complaints and things will have to still be on hold and we'll have to leave with municipal law enforcement. Hopefully they can do their best and covering for public health and until the meantime, again, I paraphrase, it seemed to be a standard response. And I, I was sharing that for about 12 months, uh, Mayor Horvath, with my constituents. And honestly, I was getting puzzled responses and people scratching their heads and just kind of wondering, Tom, I mean, more or less the pandemic, come on, we've coming out of it. Most legislation has been rescinded that was restricting uh, activities during the pandemic. Can we not get on with some enforcement of the rats and pest issue? So long preamble, uh, Mayor Horvath, again, thank you for your office's support to either Dr. Richardson or Acting Director Law can we get an update? Our staff being trained uh, in collaboration with municipal law. I believe there's a couple of hundred on the backlog list. I'm sure a lot of a number of Ward 6 ones are there. And I'm just wondering if we can get an update and time frame as to when we can, when the department will be caught up, at least with the complaints, if not all resolved, at least caught up with the complaints. Thanks, Mayor Horvath, for your indulgence. Uh, thank you, Councillor Jackson, Jackson uh, Acting Director Lawson. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, through Madam Mayor, uh, to Councillor Jackson. Thank you for the question, Councillor. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, our department has recruited a municipal law enforcement officer for this purpose. And uh, this individual is currently undergoing onboarding and orientation within the properties, uh, within the municipal law enforcement division of planning department. And uh, next week, they are expected to join the public health program for health hazards and vector-borne diseases. And they will resume some, uh, some onboarding, but we will be 
with the intention to have them start to go through those uh, log of complaints that we have to resume pest inspections and enforcement on a routine basis. That, that I'm encouraged by that, Acting Director, and just a supplementary, Mayor Horvath. So will this uh, position be permanent and not be, if you will, uh, you know, reallocated somewhere else, or once the backlog's caught up, Councillor Jackson, we feel we don't need the position anymore. Uh, you know, we're going to redeploy it again somewhere else. I think my community, my office, would like to know of some permanency to this solution, Mayor Horvath. Please. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Director. Or sorry, uh, Dr. Richardson. Please. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Mayor. Councillor, when it comes to this particular position, as you know, it's a half FTE that's funded by the city for this work. Um, we were able, because we couldn't, we were looking at a way to change how we were doing the service and do it the way we're doing now. We were um, looking to use the monies from this year, much as we were talking about earlier, and um, do uh, have a, a full-time person for the remainder of the year to assist with the work. Part of this discussion with um, municipal law enforcement is about, you know, how can we do this, you know, continue to do this work better and in a more streamlined fashion going forward. So that discussion's underway. I know you're also considering the apartments uh, and renovations issues. And so this is all part of what we're looking at from the standpoint of moving forward and how might we, you know, continue to streamline that work. So in, right now the funding is at a half FTE, which would... Um, be what is there to continue forward in the budget, but we're going to continue to look at in the remainder of this year what we might do um, moving forward from here. So it's in transition and we think getting to a better place and in the meantime, higher staffed with the funds that we have available while we're doing that, uh, that transition. Dr. Richardson, thank you for the further reassurance. Amir Horvath, I all I would ask then, in light of the uh, sensitivity and somewhat contentiousness of what we've heard from our residents, if Mayor Horvath, maybe between Dr. Richardson and Acting Director Lawson, um, maybe once they're um, uh, getting at the uh, complaint backlog list, maybe just even an information update to all of council, I would be extremely satisfied with that if the majority of my colleagues would as well. Thanks, Mayor Horvath. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Jackson, uh, and thanks for flagging that. So then that's just a, that's something that staff will take back as uh, the updates to uh, the committee uh, and council regarding the, uh, the plan going forward. Uh, I don't see then anyone else that has anything to raise on the general information other business list. We have no private and confidential. So then I think we're at the place where I am asking for a mover and seconder for the adjournment of the meeting. So can we have that mover and seconder? Moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Huang. Please indicate your electronic vote. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor McMeekin says uh, he's got a thumbs up to that. Thanks, that carries 14 to 0. Thanks very much, everybody. Great meeting. Thank you, Steph. Appreciate it.